know there's like a maybe a five second delay or ten with a stream yard. And I think we're live, and we are live. I am joined by my two brothers, incredible dear friends in the faith. I'm joined by Father Deacon Dragani and my dear brother, Subdeacon Daniel. We're here. We're going to talk about Christology. So we've got a, uh, a Roman Catholic, we've got an Eastern Catholic, and we've got an incredible Oriental Orthodox. Um, and I'm just incredibly edified by y'all's presence. And I'm, we're going to have a lot of fun talking about Christology. Uh, you don't really hear Christology and Christianity and then Islam, uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun. But before we even dive in, i got to ask you all, Father Deacon, how have you been? Fantastic. I'm on a summer break from teaching, which is a, a great thing. It gives me a oh, chance yeah. to do some more writing and other projects. So I'm enjoying oh, it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's that's the fun thing. You got more time to do uh, projects like writing, reading or, or whatever, all that great stuff, right? Oh, yeah. I'm going to put this out there right now for the world to hear for my own commitment purposes, which is I've been working on a book on Eastern Catholicism. It's about 80 percent finished. My goal wow. is to have a completed draft by the end of the summer. Wow. Incredible. That is great. So Deacon Daniel, brother, you are incredible. I'm glad to be you're back here with me. I always have fun with you. Near and dear brother to me. Uh, how have you been, brother? I'm good. Thanks. Thanks, William, again, for having me on. I've been uh, so busy. Life, man, it's crazy. I'm working on finishing up my uh, second thesis now. Wow. So trying to get that done. Yeah. I told you guys about it last time, I think. Remind me, what's it on? It's uh, early Syriac Christology before the fifth century. Wow. Yeah. Yes, incredible. I remember now. Fantastic. Yeah. So this yeah. is right up your alleyway. And I know that um, when I met Subdeacon, uh, it's been several year, years now. Wow, time really flies. Um, I remember, and it still is to this day, uh, one of the main things that we will always talk about is Mariology and Christology. And uh, I love talking about Christology. And earlier today, I was talking with my dear friend and brother, uh, Gary Machuda, about it. And one thing that came up was something very fascinating that Father Deacon alluded to before we went live and we were backstage is that later on, will God willing touch upon where on earth did Muhammad um, get his ideology of who the person of Christ was? I, I, I'm excited to pick your brain on that, uh, Father Deacon, because that really is, uh, you know, something that's very, very, something that has always interested me. And I know it'll probably interest the audience as well. But there are certain things that we find in the Quran. And, and one thing that you're going to, we're going to realize today as we have our great discussion, it's going to be one of those fun shows, I, I know it already, um, is that you find parallels to who the person of Christ is, uh, but then, of course, you also you run into a brick wall very often, as you very clearly can tell that Muhammad, uh, he believes Christ was Messiah, prophet, virgin-born, without sin, but, uh, you know, I don't think that he truly understood why Christ had all of these attributes, and I don't think that you have the true Jesus of Nazareth presented with his, within Islam. And that, to me, can create a lot of problems. Father Deacon, what are your thoughts generally on the way the Quran and Islam as a whole presents Christ? Well, yeah, first I think we should look at the question of who actually wrote the Quran. And yeah, I'm not going to get into a lot of depth of theories yet. I'll deal with that later. But according to Islam, the Islamic belief is that Muhammad did not write the Quran, but rather it was God. Correct. So in Islam, their perspective is the Quran has no human author, that rather it was God himself who spoke the words and he communicated them to Muhammad over a period of about 23 years. Now, Muhammad was illiterate. He could not read or write. Right. So Muhammad would recite these messages from God to his followers and his followers would write them down on scraps of paper or whatever was handy. And then uh, according to Islamic teaching, after Muhammad died, uh, several decades later, they gathered together everything they could find. And eventually, at a certain point, uh, after several more decades had passed, they had put together a final authoritative version of the Quran, and any other versions that were circulating, they had destroyed. So uh, from an Islamic perspective, uh, Muhammad did not write the Quran, God did. And what that means for Muslims is any translation you read is not the actual Quran. Yeah. The only real version of the Quran is actually the Arabic version. So Muslims are encouraged to learn Arabic to read the Quran as it originally is. Because uh, to differentiate this, in Christianity, we believe the Bible is the word of God and the words of men. Yeah. That there are human authors 
and that their cultures are reflected in the sacred text, as are their beliefs, but they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. In Islam, the Quran has no human author. God alone is the author. Any translation introduces a human element which corrupts it. So getting back to your question about how Islam por portrays Jesus, right? So Muhammad, if we say he's the author of the Quran, or he at least spoke it, right? God spoke through him, mm -hmm. according to Islamic belief. They portray Jesus as being a very important figure. And oftentimes people are astounded when they hear some of the similarities with Christianity. Like you mentioned before, they believe that uh, Jesus had no human author. They yeah. call him uh, Esau in the text, right? But they believe he has no human, no, no human father, I mean. Uh, Mary was a virgin when she conceived him. And they also believe that he will return, that there will be a second coming of Christ. They also view him as the Messiah as well, and that when he returns, he will judge the world. Now, I want to put a little caveat out there first, which is within Islam, there's no central magisterium, there's no central teaching authority, so you're going to find a lot of different viewpoints. And in preparation for this show, I was reviewing um, some of the different commentaries about the Quran over the centuries. And what I found is that there are commentaries with very different perspectives on Jesus, uh, all within Islam over the period of several centuries. And today there are certain like orthodoxies within Islam, certain beliefs that are widely accepted that may have been more widely questioned 200 years ago within Islam. So some of the differences, right? We talked about the similarities, but some of the differences, the biggest difference is in Islam, Jesus is not the son of God. He is not divine. They view him as a prophet and as more of a, more than a prophet. They consider him one of the messengers and a messenger is like a whole level above prophet. And these are the people who have the most important messages. They view him as a messenger, but because he's a messenger, he's not God. He's not a divine being. Uh, and they actually view the idea of Jesus being God as blasphemous. And multiple times throughout the Quran, it condemns the idea of God having a son. So that's one of the key differences there. Uh, there are others too. For example, it says that Jesus, okay, the belief within Islam, the standard belief is that Jesus did not die on the cross. Yeah. Now that comes from a, a verse. There's a verse in the Quran that's addressed against Jews. And in this particular verse, it says, you did not kill Christ or you did not kill Jesus. You did not crucify him. And that's typically interpreted as meaning that, um, Jesus did not die on the cross, that rather somebody else died in his place. There's a substitution theory. Uh, according to some viewpoints, Judas switched places with Jesus, and he was made to look like Jesus, or somebody else, a volunteer perhaps, did this. Uh, that's the common viewpoint you find. But in the past, there are viewpoints also that interpreted this differently, which was that Jesus may have died on the cross. He may have been uh, killed, um, but the Jews did not do it. It was God who did it through his command. Uh, so that's a different way of interpreting that as well. But today, the main orthodoxy within most of Islam is that Jesus did not die on a cross. He was not killed. So there are other differences, too, which I'm sure we'll get into. But there's some of the key ones. Great, great layout there, Father Deacon. Great, great job there. And I'd like to add, before I get your thoughts on that, uh, Subdeacon, that there is a very heavy burden that is on the, uh, on the Islamic community when the claim is made, and it is, it is their firm belief that the Quran is the unadulterated word of Allah. So that's a very heavy burden if we are able to find very clear errors of history, whether it be with Old Testament figures or New Testament figures, there's a major issue there it would really challenge that claim that Muslims put forth. But any, anyway, great points you bring up there, Father Deacon. So Deacon, uh, perhaps your thoughts on what Father Deacon has laid out there and any other thoughts you may have. Sure. Uh, from my experience, I, I am noticing from them that the kind of the starting point in the conversation, it's, it's already way off. There's a lot, there's a lot of, we need to, we need to kind of, we talk, we talk past each other a lot. Um, where if we're comparing the Bible and the Quran, it's already a bad discussion. So, uh, the way they view the Quran, like you're saying, William, they don't view it like we view the Bible. And, and Father Deacon mentioned earlier, 
they view the Quran like we view God the Son incarnate. So for them, the Quran is the uncreated word of God. And that is not how we view the Bible. We view Jesus, God the Son, that way. Can you maybe talk about that a little bit? I apologize for interrupting you because I don't think I've ever brought that particular point up on my show. And that you're, you're correct. That is a great point you bring up there. Yeah. So again, like uh, Father Deacon is saying, there's no central authority. So uh, I think Muslims are not all in agreement on this. But um, from what I know, the, the strictest school, um, they, they do not view that the Quran is created. They say it's uncreated and it has existed eternally. Um, and it's come down, so-called, um, to Muhammad who recited it. Um, and the, and it ha but it has existed for all time in a, in a particular place in paradise, uncreated. Uh, so the, the incarnate word, as far as we're concerned, is Jesus, the son of Mary. So actually the, the, the conversation, it shouldn't be like a lot of the time it's, it's easy to, to compare scriptures, but that's not what the conversation is. It's, is it Jesus or is it this book? And, in the Quran itself, it says Jesus is the word of God and his spirit. So I'm not sure if they know, like if I know like over time, you know, there's been like mainstream developments of how they view certain things. Like uh, so they view Jesus to be a prophet like Muhammad now. And um, uh, they for the most part, like Father Deacon said, they don't believe he died. Things like that. But uh, if we're taking it kind of in a primitive way before later developments and later interpretations, um, it's not clear because in my, in my opinion, I don't think the Quran has a consistent view on Christology or on what happened with Jesus. In some parts, it seems to emphasize his divinity and in other parts, it seems to not. Um, in some parts, it said, in one part, it says, uh, it seems to affirm that he died. In another part, it doesn't. Like when he, when he tells, he, uh, Jesus is uh, supposedly speaking with Allah, and he tells him, Lama tawafaytani. When you, uh, tawafaytani means when you, essentially, it's like a passive way of saying, like, when you allowed me to die. You know. So uh, now the English translations don't translate it that way because the mainstream opinion is that he didn't die. But that's what the verse says, you know, if you know Arabic. And, uh, and then like Father Deacon uh, implied earlier, the, the substitution theory, because again, targeting the Jews, like you didn't get what you wanted. You wanted to kill Jesus and you missed out. But they don't, it doesn't occur to them to think, well, what about for the, Last six, seven hundred years, was God tricking everyone and allowing them to think that Jesus died? And what about the, re the religion of God, de Deen Allah before Islam? What, what what were they teaching? Were they teaching that Jesus didn't die? Nobody was, right? Um, uh, I think I think there's a lot, and because they don't have this kind of central authority, central religious authority. Um, they don't, it, it's almost an out, like they don't have to deal with it, you know. Yeah. Those are very good points, sir. Uh, and you, you, I think, um, you, you, I think it was both you and Father Deacon that alluded to or flat out noted how you even read in the Quran that Christ is the word. Now, it's Surah 4 171, all people of the book. And this is very clearly, before we read it, clearly you can tell that Muhammad is hitting out against Christianity and the belief in the Trinity. Because he notes, uh, O people of the book, commit no excess in your religion, nor say of Allah aught but the truth. Christ Jesus, the son of, messenger, the son of Mary, was a messenger of Allah. And his word, which he bestowed on Mary, and his spirit proceeding from him, so believe in Allah and his messengers, say not three, desist. Now, 
here is where I, I, I encounter a number of problems. Number one, I'd like to get Father Deacon's thoughts on it first, and then you, said Deacon. Uh, very clearly, uh, by emphasizing that Christ was a messenger, clearly is lowering the status of the complete identity of who the person of Jesus of Nazareth was. Okay, he notes he's, uh, that he also gets called the Word, but I, I think that it's very different than the Logos, the Word of God from John 1, 1, very clearly different. You cannot, uh, it, there's a parallel there, but merely in, in, in Word alone, because he's not the uncreated eternal Logos that you read of in Scripture. So that's problematic there. And then you have the uh, Muhammad's attempt at um, keeping Islam monotheistic. But there's a problem there, because despite the claims of being monotheistic, uh, they believe God to be unipersonal. And God is not unipersonal either in the Old Testament or the New Testament. So we have yet another problem with say not three desist. And in other areas where there clearly is uh, hitting out, the author of the Quran is hitting out, whether it be Muhammad or whoever, hitting out at the early Christians that were, who were clearly uh, Trinitarian. So I, I find a number of problems with this. Um, your thoughts, Father Deacon? Mm -hmm. uh, first, another little general disclaimer. Um, for anyone who's listening to this, I just want to be very clear that we're trying to approach this very respectfully. Yeah. Um, I have friends that are Muslim over the years. I've taught many classes on Islam. Yeah. I have uh, Islamic students. And my experience with Muslims as people has been very, very positive. Uh, I know other people have had negative ex experiences in other parts of the world, but my experience with Muslims here in the United States has been universally uh, very, very positive. Um, so we're not trying to be disrespectful, but we are trying right. to talk about differences in a way that's genuine. Um, one of the worst trends I've seen is people who try and dialogue with Islam by downplaying the differences. Yeah. And that's not fair to Islam. That's not fair to Christianity. You know, we can't be whitewashing differences. There are real differences and talking about them openly and honestly, I think is a respectful thing to do, which mm -hmm. is what we're doing. Yep. So uh, getting back to what we're talking about here. So for example, it talks about Jesus being the word of God. It says that, it says that uh, some people have tried to explain that away by saying, well, it's referring to the message that he brought as a messenger. Um, but it's not that clear cut. The, the truth is that the picture of Jesus in the Quran is, is rather unclear. It, it says things that on the surface appear to contradict other things. So you know, at one point it says that he was not killed, he was not crucified, but then later on it talks about his death and his resurrection, and that creates problems. Now, they've tried to, to resolve some of these problems over the centuries through various commentaries by saying that, well, that's why he comes back. Um, you know, the idea of a second coming of Jesus isn't explicit in the Quran, perhaps implied but not explicit, but that it became explicit in Islam as a way of explaining his death. He has to return, fight the Antichrist, die, and be resurrected. So that's how they resolve that. But um, what, what becomes very clear is that the Quran, uh, the picture of Jesus given, directly contradicts itself in multiple places, uh, at least on the surface. But again, people have tried to explain this away, but it's not a, a, a very clear, coherent image of Jesus. Father Deacon, your your um, uh, excuse me, uh, Sub Deacon, uh, your thoughts on um, particularly Surah four one seventy one. Uh, in, in my opinion, clearly you have um, you clearly have the statements that go against the Trinitarian belief, um, and I think that the emphasis on Christ being a messenger uh, is to clearly uh, rebuke the Christians that were worshiping him as God. Your thoughts. Well, again, I, I think I think if we're taking this not anachronistically, so we're not taking the later interpretations of mainstream Islam and just the primitive verse, you know, I really think they're confused. I think that I'm not sure if it's not clear that they understand the Trinity in order to dismiss it, if they're even talking about the Trinity. Uh, I think in one place it, it implies that Mary is part of the Trinity. And um, and we know that that's not what the Trinity is. It's never been that. So um, it, it, it's not enough to know that they are intentionally being dismissive of 
uh, Christianity, per, like in the right understanding of what Christianity is. Um, here in this verse, when it's saying kalima, kalimatuhu, that's what we say, kalimat Allah. In, in Christian Arabic, the, Jesus is kalimat Allah. So he's the word of God. Now, I agree with you, William. There's not a Muslim on the earth who will say, yeah, that means the logos. You're for sure. But what if they did want to say, let's say the Quran wanted to say that Jesus is the logos. How would it say it? It would say it like this. But the understanding later, they're not going to accept it that way. They they can't. There's not an and it's saying in, in the verse itself, it's saying he's a messenger like all the other messengers. What other messenger does the Quran call Kalimat Allah? Not a single one. What other messenger does the Quran say he created something? Only him. In Arabic, the verb to create can only work with Allah. You can't say to create with any other person. It, it's not allowed in Arabic grammar. Only for Allah, yakhlaq. That's it. And because of the Quran, the only other individual to ever have the verb is Jesus. Because of the Quran. So I'm not, again, I'm telling you, I think there's uh, there's a lot of outside influences for what kind of developed this text. And sometimes maybe the influences were not in agreement with each other. And this causes confusion within the text itself. Those are very good points, Sabdeekan. And I think that <clears throat> even when having a dialogue in a respectful manner, I think we can point out that we clearly were noticing these problems. In fact, I... I did a show not long ago with uh, <clears throat> Dr. Gabriel Reynolds, very well-respected Catholic scholar in the Islamic world. He's very well-respected. And his opinion was, you just echoed it, that very clearly in the Quran, it, it really does look like the author of the Quran was influenced by a lot of outside material, even from what I gather, even apocryphal gospels. And... Um, Here's one very interesting thing. I've, I've spoken to a number of scholars about it, and Dr. Reynolds confirmed for me that within the scholarly world, Islamic scholars as well, even today, all throughout history, and even today, it's very clear that uh, Muhammad was not working with an, a full Arabic Bible. So he relied a lot on apocryphal traditions, um, and very likely couldn't read. That, that, that's an, And we're not insulting him. He very likely couldn't read. Fazi relied a lot on, on uh, traditional teachings that were spread around the, the region. Uh, Thuz, to me, in my opinion, and I, I've spoken with multiple scholars, and of course an Islamic scholar who is staunch in the religion are not going to agree, but from what I can tell, I think that plays a big part in the fact that Muhammad gets a lot of the chronologies wrong. He will mix up Old Testament figures uh, with New Testament figures in a, in a very clearly problematic historical timeline. Uh, so that's another thing that can be discussed. We can uh, discuss that later. But uh, I think that it's very clear. The author of the Quran was aware of um, a lot of Orthodox Christian theology and um, and also aware of a heterodox theology. Seems to me like he also incorporated some of that heterodox theology. Now, the idea of, well, where did he get, where was he influenced from? That's one area I've always been fascinated to dialogue about and to really you know we could talk about that perhaps you know father deacon what are your thoughts on that any idea as to you know where did the influence come from or yeah you know? yeah uh, first just to backtrack slightly i want to Definitely. respond to something that subdeacon said um, about the misunderstanding of christianity that's presented in the quran um, it, it does show a miss some fundamental misunderstanding is what christianity teaches so perhaps one of the most famous uh, passages with Jesus in the Quran is in Surah 5, I believe, where there's a miracle story where Jesus, um, his disciples say that they're hungry, right? He needs to feed them. So again, we're getting some images here of, say, the miracle of the feeding of the thousands. Uh, but in this particular case, what Jesus does is he prays to God the Father to send down a table of food to feed his disciples. But at that point, 
uh, it appears in the Quran, at least in, in certain readings of it, that at that point, God begins to question Jesus. And he says to him, uh, Jesus, have you ever claimed that you are a God to be worshipped? Have you ever claimed that your mother is a God to be worshipped? So he asks Jesus explicitly, have you ever claimed that you're a God to be worshipped or that your mother is a God to be worshipped? And the Jesus of the Quran says, absolutely not. I would never do such a thing. Um, but what that shows there is that they seem to believe that in Christianity, Mary is worshipped as a God. So there was definitely um, some misunderstanding of what Christianity was about, because obviously that's never been a Christian teaching, not even close. Um, there's also misunderstanding of what we mean by God the Son. The problem that comes up is when we talk about Jesus being God the Son, uh, Islam historically has interpreted that as meaning that we believe that God took on a physical body and physically impregnated Mary through the sexual act. Um, obviously, we do not believe that. But again, their understanding of, of, of how this works is pretty skewed. Um, just like many, many uh, wonderful, well-meaning Protestant Christians dramatically misunderstand what Catholicism teaches, um, so do many well-meaning Muslims. They also misunderstand what traditional Christianity teaches. So that's a problem. But getting back to what also what Subdeacon was saying, um, some scholars believe that when the Quran was being put together or compiled, that there were multiple sources used. Now, one thing that a lot of scholars, even within Islam, will recognize is that there's a, a dramatic switch of tone at a certain point in the Quran. So there's a whole, you know, for a, a good long while, it appears within the Quran to be very, very, um, how should I put it, agreeable with other monotheistic religions. It, it speaks very positively about Christianity and Judaism, and it presents a very um, temperate approach to these other traditions. And then at a certain point, it becomes much more antagonistic towards Judaism and Christianity. And the, the switch in tone is rather dramatic, actually. And one theory that's been put out there is that part of the Quran was written uh, in Mecca. And then later on, when Muhammad relocated to Medina, the, the rest of it was written. And that's often used to describe the change in tone. But other scholars would go a step further and say that there appear to be sources that they're clearly looking at, they drew from, that didn't necessarily complement each other. So one of the main sources that it seems to be pulled from is the Gospel of Luke. I mean, we have the story of the Annunciation with a lot of elements that clearly came from the Gospel of Luke. It's, it's very clearly in there. Uh, the infancy Gospel of Thomas. We see the story of Jesus turning the, uh, the birds of clay into living birds. And the way it's presented in the Quran, it says explicitly that Jesus made the birds of clay and then breathed into them and giving them life, which strangely enough is actually a, a godlike thing, isn't it? Because um, that's how God made Adam, right? He created him out of clay and breathed life into him. But they're pulling that almost directly from the infancy gospel of Thomas. Uh, there are other gospels. I think the gospel of Barnabas is a Gnostic gospel that talks about Jesus switching places with somebody. Somebody else died on the cross, not Jesus. That came from the Gnostics. So all these different sources are being pulled in there together. And perhaps they were pulled in there without necessarily understanding what they meant. Again, some scholars say this. Now, Muslims, of course, believe this is God speaking. I'm respectful towards that position, but many scholars do believe that multiple sources were used and pulled in. And as they were used, they weren't necessarily understood. That's a key thing here. And you have to ask another question, which is, why is Jesus even in the Quran? What, what, what's, that, what's the purpose of having him in there? Um, some would say that he's explicitly put in the Quran for the reason of explaining that he's not God. Because if Jesus is God, what's the purpose of Muhammad? Muhammad is supposed to be the final messenger, but if God already came in human flesh, why would another messenger be even, even necessary? It wouldn't be. So some people have argued, some scholars have argued that Jesus is in the Quran explicitly for the purpose of refuting the unique claims of Christianity. Maybe that's the reason, but we will say this. Um, we know, and again, Muslims believe, mainstream Muslims believe the Quran was compiled and put together in its current form decades after Muhammad died, uh, you know, probably at least two or three decades after he died. Well, by that point in time, 
uh, Islam had already expanded. Because what Islam did was it had united these various warring Arab tribes together into, into one body. And for centuries, they've been fighting each other. But under Islam, they found a common cause. And they began to expand out. And by the time the Quran was compiled in its form that we have today, um, they had many subjects under their dominion who were Jewish and Christian. So it's possible that maybe some people thought that the Quran needs to kind of neutralize the claims of both Judaism and Christianity. And maybe the hope was that having Jesus in the Quran and having, you know, the, the, the prophets of Judaism in the Quran, the Quran itself could serve as a unifying force that would unite Jews, Christians, and Muslims together. So maybe that's the reason why Jesus is in the Quran as well. Uh, again, that's if you go under the belief that it was compiled decades later and not written by Muhammad. Now, what further complicates this though, and again, a lot of this is really murky, it appears that parts of the Quran were written much earlier than anyone thought. Um, a twist was thrown in things about seven or eight years ago. So this is an interesting story. Um, back in the 1920s, there was a Chaldean Catholic priest. I forget his name, but he um, he kind of had a, a dispute with his bishop, left the priesthood and went to England. But he had a great knowledge of Syriac and the ancient cultures and whatnot. Really a profound scholar. He had taught ancient languages. He became friends with um, some fellows at Birmingham University in England. And there he became also acquainted with the Cadbury family. And the Cadbury family was interested in acquiring texts from the Middle East, ancient texts. So they funded him to go on multiple uh, research journeys. He came back with thousands of volumes of ancient literature from the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia and other places. Well, a lot of this stuff sat there and was cataloged, but not well understood. But researchers have been poring over it over the decades. And in 2015, they discovered something pretty remarkable. They discovered what's believed to be the oldest version of the Quran that we have, you know, written out. And what's remarkable, especially, is that it appears that it may have been written during the lifetime of Muhammad, possibly before the birth of Muhammad even. They did carbon dating on on the uh, book itself and found that it actually could possibly be dated before Muhammad was even born, which raises a whole other series of problems. Um, you know, one theory that's been put out there by some scholars, again, this is just a theory. Some scholars believe that the Quran may have existed in some form before Muhammad came along and that Muhammad kind of uh, took it and kind of built a religion around it and reshaped it in some ways. Again, I'm not saying that's true. We don't know for sure, but that's one theory that's been circulated. But the point of all this is the where all of this came from is pretty much um, hard to pin down. There's a lot of murkiness here as to how all of this came together and all the sources used. Great point, sir. Uh, Sadiq, your thoughts? Uh, I want to I want to comment on what Father Deacon is saying about um, like kind of the Meccan and Medinan periods. Yeah stuff like that uh so when i was reading the quran i was trying to read it with the mindset of i'm ethnically arab i'm reading it in arabic i'm a christian a, a person of the book and i'm not i'm not going to factor in any islamic tradition i i, I if, if you will sola scriptura for the quran okay i'm just going to try to read it like that uh and there, I found no reason, according to the Quran, for me to not to like the, the Quran was not telling me as a person of the book that I should stop being a person of the book. So, no, on the contrary, there's not a single uh, mention of the Bible being corrupt or all these later accusations that, that happened. Um, I think like the closest thing you get is some criticism of hypocrisy of certain clergy or something like that. And 
we would we will openly admit. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll admit my own hypocrisy and and whatever you want, you know. But um, uh, it's not it's not uh, it's not an exclu the Quran isn't doesn't seem to be exclusive against the people of the book. It's uh, it's encouraging of of that religion of the religion of the people of the book and a claim to be the continuation of them. So it's, it makes it, it makes you feel like we're all in that family. And then, um, the, the warnings, the, the, uh, kind of the threats and things like that are either political, like there are against people of the book. If it's, if it's a political, if it's a war, not if, not if, uh, not religious, uh, but like, for example, if the if the if the Muslims are fighting the Romans who are Christian, so then they they need to submit not because they're Christian, they need to submit because they're not in the same state as them. So, it's um, I think later interpretations have have changed things, but if we're reading it just on its own like that, I don't think it needs to have this kind of understanding to be uh, anti-Christian. I don't think it was originally like that. I, I think it has a lot of Christian influence. Uh, I think it was even, it wasn't even secret back then. If, if, uh, if I wish there was a way to kind of definitively know that, but this is my hypothesis. And um, uh, there's a lot of things that show this, like when Muhammad goes, when he takes refuge in Orthodox Ethiopia, you know, against the pagans in in Hejaz in Mecca. Um, so uh, and and the Arabs at the time, seventh uh, century, and they they were kind of a mess. And there were many different forms of Christianity and many different religions there. And I don't think I think Islam was very nationalistic. Um, it was kind of a way for hey guys. We have something now too. It's not just our Aramaic cousins and the, our Hebrew cousins and the Copts over there. And the Arabs, they they find something came to them. This was kind of that we got our own thing. Uh, and uh, from what Father Deacon said, um, maybe there's some parts that are pre-Muhammad because there was the Hanaf movement. There were the. It could be possible, and the reason why is because. It was the 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 environment or the arena was kind of it was cooking that already. the The Arabs wanted their own thing, their own uh, religious tradition that is part of that Semitic family. That's that they that already they they received. So, um, and I don't think they intended it to be what it became later. Now, um. The thing that makes Islam, I think, a little bit, not completely unique, but a little bit unique, is the emphasis, the very strong emphasis on the state. Whereas it exists in, in as, let's say, maybe the Old Testament or something. But I think it's, um, it's like absolutely essential, necessary for Islam to have a state. Is the, we're living in the only time in history when it, they didn't have a state. Right. So um, and because of that, uh, it's the the business that Muhammad took away from those who controlled the pilgrimage. Abu Sufyan's family, the later known as the Umayyads, um, they're the ones who took Islam. So after Muhammad. It was like Abu Bakr, Uthman, uh, Abu Bakr, uh, Omar, Uthman, and uh, I don't remember. But then, and then after Ali and all that that stuff happened, and then the Umayyad had have their own dynasty. Then, so this family was controlling uh, Quraysh. They're the Quraysh. They were they were controlling Mecca and the pilgrimage anyway when they were pagans. So then, eventually, the mindset became: if you can't beat them, join them. Right? Then they became the controllers of Islam. They're the ones who put the Quran together. 
They're the ones who made the Dhimmi pact with the Christians and the Jizya and uh, all that stuff. The Harub al Ridda, uh, Abu Bakr forced every, all the Arabs who left Islam after Muhammad died, he forced them to come back. So, all the early Islamic tradition that is after the Quran was based on this family that was originally against Muhammad anyway. So, it's like, how can you really know what the teachings are? How can you, how can you, even the people who doubt that Muhammad existed, it's hard for me to, to argue with them. I'm not saying I don't believe he existed. Right now, I do believe he existed. But it's just like there's so little information about anything that early on in Islamic history. You can't really know anything definitively or not. The Syriac influence... I don't, I don't want to take too long. I'm just going to mention this last sentence and then move on. The, the Syriac influence on, uh, on, on early Islam on the Quran is undeniable. When that door is opened, academically speaking, I think it's going to change everything. Great, great point there. Now, that door is opening academically already. I can tell you right now, in my dialogue with Dr. Reynolds, who as people, you all probably know uh, he's one of the top scholars in the world in Islam over there at Notre Dame. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned to him how within Islam, there is a very, very clear parallel mentioned that um, the mention that Christ and Mary were not pricked by Satan. That is very similar to the Nisabine hymn of Ephraim the Great where Ephraim notes how only Christ and Mary are without stain, but it's right in the context of being under the dominion of the devil. It's a very clear parallel, mind-blowing. And when I ran that by Dr. Reynolds, he told me that it very likely could have come, been borrowed from Ephraim, that scholarship does recognize Syriac Christianity had an incredibly deep influence on, uh, on Islam. And, and that was something that I was not aware of, and when we realize that, that to me is mind-blowing. You have similar language in the great St. Jacob of Sarug. Uh, so the influence is undeniable. Uh, with that being said, it, when you, if you look at that, you, you have within Islam a great respect for Mary. And, and we, we definitely uh, we recognize that. We appreciate that. Um, and they even believe Mary to be sinless as well. So that's you can clearly tell that they're, from what I can tell, very clear influence from Christians as well. Father Deacon, perhaps your thoughts, any thought you may have as well. Yeah, so um, again, as many scholars have said, or many scholars believe, there's definitely a strong Christian influence. Various Christian sources are, are interwoven into Islam. Um, and because of that influence and because of that history, you know, Jesus has to play a prominent role in it. But at the same time, there's another problem, which is, again, if Jesus is God incarnate, what's the purpose of Muhammad? Muhammad needs to be the final messenger. Um, so Jesus is there, but what's his role? The role they essentially give him is to kind of prepare the way for Muhammad. But Jesus in the Quran is presented in, in a much more unique and powerful way than, than Muhammad is. Um, part of the issue, too, though, is in Christianity, what's the role of Jesus? He's our savior. He's our savior. We need a savior. Uh, in the Islamic worldview as presented in the Quran, there's no need for a savior because, again, there are different interpretations of Islam, different viewpoints. I want to generalize. But generally speaking, in Islam, the problem with the world isn't that the world is dealing with evil as much as the world is dealing with ignorance. You know, in the Christian worldview, the world is fighting evil. Evil has found its way into the hearts of, of human beings, has corrupted the world. Christ came to be our savior from evil and its consequences. But in the Islamic worldview, the problem is ignorance. Um, people don't know the truth. They don't know the true religion. So what you need is a messenger to educate them. You don't need a savior. So for that reason, this, this person of Jesus who, who found its way into the Quran, again, according to some scholars through various sources, he has no great, he has no role to play because where does he actually fit into the uh, theology of it? It's it's um it's interesting. What a great point! I think you made a lot of very good points there, uh, Father Deacon, and and it really, uh, it does get me to the next um, point that I wanted to bring up. That 
again, earlier we talked about how within Islam, um, our Lord is presented as prophet, messenger, Messiah as well. We have here in Surah 345, 47. <clears throat> Behold, the angel said, O Mary, Allah giveth, giveth thee glad tidings of a word from him. His name will be the Messiah Jesus, the son of Mary held in honor in this world and the hereafter and of those nearest to Allah. She said, O oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man hath touched me? He said, even so Allah createth what he willeth. When he hath decreed a plan, he said, he but saith, be and it is. So uh, you, you brought up a really, in my opinion, perhaps the best point, Father Deacon, the, the essential point that what is what is essentially the role of Christ within Islam. So he's a messiah, he's a messenger, he's a prophet. But all of those identity markers in the Old Testament pointed to the eternal king, the eternal priest, son of David, who was eternal God. So it wasn't just like Christ was simply the messiah, simply a messenger. He was a particular kind of messenger. He was a he was the Messiah, son of David, eternal God, uh, and the Logos, the uncreated Logos. And if you read Surah 345 to 47, uh, to me, it very clearly is presenting, um, you know, you have similar parallels there. He's the Messiah and what have you. But then you have something that you're, you, you, no apostolic Christian would ever utter that our Lord is created. I mean, none of us would believe that. I mean, we would talk, we could talk about he, he took his flesh from his mother Mary, but ultimately the Quran doesn't mean that. The Quran means that Christ is a part of creation. And I think of early fathers, Ephraim is one, I think of St. Justin the Martyr and others that talk about Christ being the commander of creation, not actually a creature. So that too, is, it seems to me like there's a little bit of a mishmash and a little bit of a, of a, confusion there perhaps your thoughts on that subdeacon and then i'll i'll go to uh to, to father deacon so the uh, with this stuff i ne i've learned to never trust the english on these translations okay yeah it's uh i would like i had there's like multiple islamic yeah. websites that translate you know mm -hmm. i can't trust a single one of them i always have to because yeah. they're not doing it right like i don't know which one you got this from too but it's like they they purposely try to kind of I don't know it's like they change the grammar to mean something else. Like, you you know for to clarify for the audience you know Arabic. Yeah. 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 So he goes and Allah yubashiruki bi kalimatun kalimatun minnahu. So ismahu al Masih Isa bin Maryam. So he's saying the word the word's name is Jesus the son of Mary. Jesus the wow. Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of Mary. I will, uh, uh, Yubashuruki, like he evangelizes, or kinds of like Yubashuruki, like you know, you go tell them the good news it means, you know? Wow. Um, and so he's telling her, this is the, the good news of a word, uh, his, like his word, possessive he to God. And the name of the word, the word is a feminine word. Kelima is a feminine. Mm. Okay. Kalima is a feminine word. His name. So they're using the feminine just like we do. We say Kalima Allah, but we talk about it in the masculine because it's about him. And then they say, and his name about the word, the, the word is Jesus, the, the Messiah, the son of Mary. So look at the, it's undeniable because they're hearing it from us. We're already there. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been already saying for six hundred years he's the word of God. Let me let me briefly interrupt you because you yeah. know the Arabic. Am I am I am I correct in saying that uh, it is presenting Christ as created, or am I or is that is that not correct? Can you repeat the question, William? From, from what I'm reading, uh, and I'll get Father Deacon's thoughts afterwards. From what I'm reading is, uh, it seems like Allah createth what He willeth. Are they including Christ as as a creature? That it seems to me when he says be and it is, and then later on they liken Christ to the creation of Adam. So, so again, this is a problem with the translation here again. Uh, the word create. Uh, okay, so here it, it's implying that he creates what he wants or he said he says 
um, like he he says to be and it is uh -huh. stuff like that. Um, it, it, it's just saying that he could do whatever he wants, but okay. it could be it could be okay an implication that it's implying that he's created. But okay. we wouldn't we wouldn't have a problem saying that the humanity of yeah, Christ, yeah, yeah, yeah. Created, you know. But but is he doing that? That is my, that you know. Th then you gotta look. We can give the benefit of the doubt all we want, but do you really think that that is what was being met, sent, said here? Uh, you, your honest thoughts. Uh, my honest thoughts at this time. Yeah. Early on, I really don't think they were thinking it through. Okay. Yeah, like I, I think, yeah, I think there were that. there were so many uh, influences Syriac, whether Nestorian or Monophysite or Miyaz, right. whatever you know. And I think it kind of just all got jumbled right. up in there. Yeah, yeah. Ha, Father Deacon, have you also no noticed? Because uh, I have run into some really bad translations, and as uh, as uh, some Deacon points out here. Uh, sometimes the translations are just pretty, pretty wonky. There, uh, have you run into pretty some bad translations at times as well? Yeah, I, I have, I have. And again, there's a whole field of scholarship about how to translate the Quran, and there are some different questions about that. So, um, you know, interestingly enough, there are some books out in recent years that put forth the the theory, and against the theory, but there may be something to it that the best way to read the Quran isn't so much in the light of modern Arabic as much as it's looking at early Arabic and also Aramaic, because Aramaic may have been spoken in that region at that time as well. And if you approach the language that way, it actually reads very differently in some places. Like a, one stunning example I came across is this. Um, so many of us have heard the, the, the supposed teaching in the Quran that uh, if you die as a martyr for Islam, you'll have virgins waiting for you in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. So it presents this image of paradise as being like perhaps a, a this the sexual fulfillment. Um, but if you actually look at the words that's translated as virgins, in if you look at it through early Arabic or Aramaic, it can actually be read to say white raisins. Wow, white grapes. Yeah. 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 Instead of uh, yeah. white grapes, instead of virgins. Yeah. And that actually lines up with other texts that talk about white grapes being in paradise. And that makes a whole lot more sense than talking about virgins being waiting there for martyrs. So if you wow. look at it through a different linguistic lens, it reads so differently. It comes from Ephraim. Ephraim said it in a poet, a poem. Really? Really? Yeah. He, he said, wow. paradise is so beautiful. Not only does it have red grapes, it has white grapes too. So um, it's, I was not aware of that. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know that either. Even, even Father Deacon, when he's saying earlier about the substitution verse, he appeared to die. This also comes from Ephraim in his commentary on Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, Sebastian Brock wrote, writes an article about this. Oh. So uh, Ephraim here, he's talking, he's saying he appeared to die. And then he gives his explanation on what he means, meaning because he's God the Word, so in his divinity, he doesn't die. Yeah. He dies in, according to his humanity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is so much Ephraim in the Quran and in early Islamic tradition. And oh. they have no idea who this Ephraim the Syrian is. They've probably never heard of him. But right. he's all over their stuff because of the Syriac, um, again, whether it be Nestorian or Manafs or whatever it is, the Syriac outside influence that is that they're taking this tradition from and just kind of putting it in there. Uh, the Book of the Cave of Treasures, if you've heard of it, it's a Syriac apocryphal book. Their whole entire, their whole creation account comes from there. Um, a lot of their stories come from that book. Um, so, I think I think once the connections are made between Ephraim's poems and this, it's going to change a lot of stuff. Wow, I, I was not aware of the Ephraim connections there. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. And by yeah. the way, I just want to say how awesome it is having Subdeacon Daniel. As a part yeah. of this conversation, because <laughs> his knowledge of er Ephraim and Syriac Christianity is, is amazing. Yeah. Plus, his knowledge of Arabic and the culture is extremely helpful to this discussion. So it's great having you here, Subdeacon. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, definitely. I'm, I'm glad that you joined us. You truly um, make these discussions really shine, shine through. You do as well, Father Deacon, but great, great job there. I learned a lot um, from him. 
I learned a lot yeah. today. Yeah, I, I did as well. You guys. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I definitely did as well. And um, yeah, that's really, really insightful. And it really does supplement what uh, Dr. Reynolds told me. Scholarship has been noticing more and more. Now, maybe scholarship needs to spend more time in the Syriac Fathers to find a lot more um a lot more gold nuggets so that is really really interesting so um again that's interesting on the translations so i don't know if there is any any variant here but here are some other things that i found quite fascinating uh the fact that uh christ is holy he's all holy within uh islam um and uh you read of him uh you read uh right here it says that is easy for me and we wish to appoint him as a sign unto men and a mercy from us. So to me, what I notice when I look at the Islamic Christology, if you will, I don't, I don't truly believe they have a Christological system, but you, you gentlemen, you brothers know what I mean. Uh, you have, to me, clearly a lot of parallels in the Old Testament. Uh, I think of a, uh, that sign that a virgin will give birth and conceive in Isaiah 7, 14, uh, many areas where Christ is presented as messenger, um, the Messiah, of course. But um, the one thing, and, and then Father Deacon mentioned earlier how there's Father Deacon and Subdeacon, how there are a lot of a lot of the Gospel of Luke that enters into the Quran. But I, I, again, I find that I don't know what kind of what happened with the uh, Muhammad will take it to a certain point or the author of the Quran. And then you'll, you won't get the full picture because the virgin birth is also a very important um, theological truth in scripture that is taught within Islam, within the Quran. What it, ultimately, what does the virgin birth teach? Uh, the virgin shall give birth to a child and he shall be called Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. And uh, these are little things like the identity of the Messiah, the virgin birth, sinlessness of Christ that all point to the full picture of Christ being eternal God. And you don't get that within Islam. And that is something that I want to talk about now. Why not? Why is that particular element a no-go? Is it because uh, Muhammad just really had a deficient understanding of the Trinity and truly believed it to be poly polytheistic? Or is it because it didn't fit into his message uh, of him ultimately being uh, the last and the greatest of the prophets. Uh, and I'd love to pick your brain on that first, Father Deacon. Why do you think that particular area is left out? Because as we know as well, mm -hmm. we'll give the audience a teaser. We're not do doing it today. God willing, in the future, we're also going to talk about Mariology. Mm -hmm. And we know that within Islam, they believe Mary is all sinless, perpetual virginity, uh, bodily assumption. But they cannot believe Mary is Theotokos. They can't believe she's mother of God. Because then they would have to admit Christ is God. And that's one element that they cannot, one road they cannot go down. Now, Father Deacon, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Well, as with other things, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what Christian teaching actually is. So when yeah. we talk about, you know, Jesus being God or divine or being God the Son, um, Islam traditionally has misinterpreted this as meaning that Jesus was created and became God. So they often there's often this misunderstanding that 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 Christians believe that God took on physical form, had relations with Mary, um, gave birth to a human being who's not divine named Jesus, and then that God, Allah, then somehow made this created person a part of God. Um, they don't Historically, Islam did not understand the idea of Christ being the incarnate word and the word pre-existing. Uh, that's probably the main issue there. And I think that's right. one of the reasons, or others, but one of the reasons why that, that couldn't fit into the system because they really misunderstood what we meant. They thought that basically it was like an adoptionism. They didn't understand the idea of Christ being pre-existent and eternally existing. Great, great point. So, Deacon, uh, perhaps your thoughts on that. Um, you know, because just to run it by you again, uh, we clearly have within Islam, they'll, they'll tell you, they'll, they believe Christ sinless, the Messiah, messenger, the virgin born. 
uh, many parallels that we have within our faith. But ultimately, we have these parallels because they're prophecies that have been fulfilled from the Old Testament. Uh, very clearly prophecies that were pointing to uh, a particular person, that being our eternal high priest, Christ. And that uh, clearly is not the ultimate conclusion within Islam. They don't believe Christ is eternal God. Your thoughts as to why deficient crystal, deficient understanding of the Trinity, uh, Muhammad just couldn't go that far. You know, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. So I want to I want to also mention something Father Deacon said earlier about we do, in Islam we don't need a savior. Um, so again, I don't think they have thought things through in a lot of these topics, William, because. They have a, a, a major holiday, Eid al-Adha. What is Eid al-Adha? It's the sacrifice. It's about uh, Abraham and Isaac. What's the point of it? What, what they And if you go to the Middle East, they all take sheep and they they sacrifice the sheep. Well, what are you getting for the sacrifice? What, what are you doing there? And uh, it's kafariya. Uh, it's a... It's, uh, uh, in, I don't know in English, like it's like the the Old Testament how it covers for sins, you know. That's what they're doing. That's what it is. So if you need a sacrifice to cover for sins, <laughs> so, yeah. so then you need a savior. And yeah. I don't think they've thought this through. So this, and then uh, your question, like we have, you know, prophecies like uh, uh, a virgin shall give birth, and you'll call his name Emmanuel, and for God with us. And then the Quran has nothing like this kind of language. And I think, in my opinion, it's because, first, I don't think the comparison is fair. I think the standard of, of what we're expecting in the Quran, it's not fair for us to expect that. Mm -hmm. we, should, we should change the standard for them because that's not the goal of the Quran. The goal is not... Yeah. To be a theological book, the goal is, in my opinion, to have a book that is in verse, in Arabic, at that time, because it was like, I, I'm, I'm going to say this in modern terms for, for the audience to understand. Arab so Arabian society at the time was, uh, it was like, you kind of... Um, what is it like battle rapping you know but with 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 your like each tribe had a poet so you'd have your oh. poet against the other tribes poet and they'd go at it with each other and the best poet wins and that that was like really cool so one of the challenges in the quran is that nothing can be produced like it in in verse okay so i don't think they were concerned with having kind of strong theology and and, and uh, you know, um, like prophecies and stuff like that. It was just concerned with being like this really cool book that has like verses and it talks about monotheism. And I don't think it's as, uh, I don't think it's intended to be what we're expecting okay. because when I, even when I read it, I was like, okay, like this is, this is the Quran. <laughs> it's not, it's not, uh, it's not it's it has a different goal it's being written and the thing about why they reject the divinity of Jesus father deacon was was saying they 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 have this misunderstanding firstly of the trinity and secondly of the incarnation of adoptionism but also i would say they have a similar misconception to jehovah's witnesses where they make uh, the the word father and god to be synonymous interchangeable and exclusive yeah so if you're talking about so jehovah's witnesses usually tell you uh if when jesus is praying is he praying to himself yeah yeah because they're they're thinking we're saying jesus is the father but it's yeah. not what we're saying you know if you ask a muslim a conservative you know uh orthodox muslim if you ask them is the quran created and they tell you no then you ask them well is the quran god and then they'll they'll maybe take a second and they'll probably tell you no. Well, then how is it uncreated and eternal if it's not him? 
are there two gods? Are there two uncreated eternal things? And it'll take he they haven't thought it through. So then we believe that there is an eternal uncreated word. And that word, inseparable from his father, the, the word of the father took flesh from the Virgin Mary. Yeah. And all of this, we've had church councils about it. We've had theologians about it. St. Athanasius, St. Cyril, Council of Ephesus, Council of Nicaea, all these. Well, they didn't have that. Plus, they're, they're 600 years younger than us. So they haven't... Uh, Thought it through. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. 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 Father Deacon, your thoughts on that. Um what what he was what Subdeacon was saying about the um the beauty of the language, you know, being in some ways more important than presenting a coherent theology. Right. Uh, it, what's interesting is if you look at some of the historical traditional arguments to show that the Quran is from God, very often over the centuries, people would point to the Quran and say, uh, if you look at this text, the beauty and the eloquence of it is proof that it's of divine origin. And uh, that's oftentimes one of the main proofs they, they would go to historically. You know, nothing like this existed in the Arab language. That right. means this must be of divine origin. So it's, it's interesting that, that that would be in some ways given a greater priority than, than necessarily presenting a thought out theological system. Yeah. And, and you, you had mentioned that uh, earlier on in the show, Father Deacon, how uh, maybe one of the biggest issues is that we're approaching the Quran as if we, uh, as the same way as when we approach the Bible, and it really is a completely different way that it's laid out. Now, one final question I'd like to ask you, you gentlemen, is um, the figure of Christ. We've been talking about Christ and Christology; it's been incredibly edifying. Now, a little, a little bit murkier when it comes to whether or not Christ died on the cross. Now, I can tell you already that I have talked to a number of Muslim scholars, and at times I get different answers there, um, which is confusing. <laughs> you know, that can be quite confusing. But there is this other issue that within Islam, they don't believe that Christ bodily rose from the dead. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, from your research and reading into Islam, uh, Father Deacon, uh, will there be a future resurrection and will christ be part of that future resurrection your thoughts on that well again the interpretations on this are, are, are very different you can yeah. find different uh schools in islam that look at this very differently you know today we're in an interesting place where oftentimes people refer to themselves as being muslims and they say we're muslims and so we believe as muslims but 200 years ago it was more common for them to identify themselves as i am of this school um, the idea of Islam being a more general monolithic religion is very much a modern conception. So 200 years ago, Muslims would identify themselves from being in you know, different schools. And those schools often looked at these things very differently, especially when it comes to eschatology. That's where you find some of the most different variant interpretations. Um, but a common variant, common interpretation you'll find in many types of Islam, many interpretations of Islam, is that Christ never died while he was here. Um, he was rescued from the cross. He didn't die on the cross. He was assumed to heaven. Um, but he's going to come back. He's going to fight the Antichrist. And then he's going to die. Mm -hmm. And then after that death, he's going to be resurrected. And then according to some interpretations, the first thing he's going to do is go to all of the churches and destroy the crosses. Um, yeah, and then he and then he's going to force everyone to adopt the one true religion of Islam. That's an interpretation you find. Now, there are other schools of Islam that don't read it that way, because really when it comes to this eschatological stuff, the Quran doesn't say a whole lot. Most of this is just inferred or comes from later interpretations. Yeah, that's a really, really good point that you bring up there, that you have varying interpretations, so various different ones and various um, different insights. Uh, so Deacon Daniel, your thoughts on that, and then afterwards perhaps we can give some uh, wrap-up thoughts. So, but your thoughts on, um, again, to me, I find it in, 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 we have an issue here that since we don't have a clear, clear teaching of the bodily resurrection, this also was at the heart of early Christology, the lack of that within the Quran, within Islam, uh, to me, again, it's, it's just another example where we diverge from the historical person 
the historical figure of Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, just uh, to kind of go on with what Father Deacon was saying too about some of the eschato eschatological stuff, it could be a little bit offensive for Christians to hear, like the, the breaking of the crosses. There's another, the egg, egg, and just like Father Deacon said, it's not, a, they're, these aren't concrete, like, you know, pillars. It depends who you ask, you know, but um, they're, there's one where uh, Jesus was praying behind the Mahdi as if the Mahdi is greater than him. Um, there's one where uh, Muhammad takes Mary as his wife. It's blasphemous. Things like that, you know. Um, so uh, the, I, I don't, it's, they don't have, because they don't have like this kind of uh, creed or dogma that is kind of, you know, solidified in councils or in in, in um, like a, a tradition of uh, that is canonized by the church kind of thing. It's it's so messy, and uh, I think their Christology, the reason why it's become concrete over time, where there isn't a Muslim now who will tell you uh, that Jesus is God, is because of the apologetic. Uh, the historical precedent that they have with us about the topic um, over the 1400 years. They've had to talk to us about it. So what do we know who Jesus is from the Quran? Eh, but we know he's not God. Why? Because we've been arguing with the Christians about it for 1400 years. Um, the, the mosque in Jerusalem, uh, the Dome of the Rock. So the verse on the outer, uh, you know, like on the roof there, the, the verse in Arabic and calligraphy, I think it was the one of the Ottoman sultans, if I remember correctly, I can't remember who, he made it verses about, against Christians, because it was after the Crusades that they had taken it back, and stuff like that. It was like that time period. So, a lot of their apologetic is about this because they were dealing with it with us, but that it's still, it's still, uh, it's like they're they're skipping, they're skipping all the early stuff to just say we're kind of fighting with these guys. But their early coins, they they were using our coins. They used to put crosses on their own yep. coins. Till now, till now, if you go to uh, some cities in Iraq, like Tikrit, if you guys have heard of Tikrit, Tikrit is a Muslim city. The when they what they used to be the capital of the Syriac Orthodox Church in Iraq it used to be before now there's no Christians there, but till now all the Muslims who were are, they're all originally Christian but to all the Muslims there when they make bread the women they put a cross in the bread when they bake it till today, and wow. this is true in a lot of places even if they don't know themselves why they're like that I've had Arabs come up to me and say my my ancestors were Christian. And according to the tribe, I would know, you know, so they just, uh, they have this history with us. It's underdeveloped. Their theology is underdeveloped. And I, because they're not centralized, maybe, I don't see a way for it to kind of change with that. But I think the online forum, I think what you're doing, William, and uh, what's been going on, it's kind of making the world a lot smaller and it's, it's forcing the conversation. So now they're they're thinking about this and the back and forth, uh, although at times, you know, the Internet is not the most healthy place. It can get toxic and whatever. But at the end yeah. of the day, I think it it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing to have these conversations like this. Yeah, yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. And I think we've had a an incredibly fruitful dialogue and in, in talking about an area that you really don't hear a whole lot about comparing the figure of Christ within Islam, and then looking at Christology from the way apostolic Christians look at it. And I've been incredibly edified by you, your presence this evening, uh, Subdeacon and Father Deacon. And uh, we'll be talking in the future. We'll be doing another panel on Mariology, God willing, and we're going to talk about it from uh, an Islamic perspective and then look at it from a uh, perspective of a unique uh, Syriac perspective, Eastern Catholic perspective. It'll be incredibly edifying but before, um, as we get ready to wrap up, I'd love to 
you know, give you a chance to give any closing thoughts you have, Subdeacon, and then follow it up with any plug you want, might want to put in, and then I'll follow it up with you, uh, Father Deacon. I'd love to get you all's kind of closing summation. Thank you, William. Thank you again for having me on. Uh, I look forward to any future thing with you guys, always. Um, and uh, I don't have any plugs. I've been I've been MIA again for a while. Um, and I, I hope to be back soon, you know, getting everything active. Um, I have, I've, I've had these plans with Elijah for a while and we just kept pushing them back. So I hope to get back on that with the Jacob of Saruj stuff. Um, and I hope my, I will be finishing my thesis soon and getting that published because I think, uh, I think it could be a common blueprint for all of our traditions. Uh, because it's it deals with the shared Syriac tradition before all the schisms, you know. Great, great. But you want to put in a, a plug maybe for your channel or anything? Yeah, my channel, The Lion's Den. Awesome. Um, look, look out for uh, com episodes coming soon with uh, with Yusuf Slaib. We're gonna uh, and by the way, William, I'm telling you this on the air. He he mentioned to me uh, privately, but he's like, ask William. If he wants to do a show, me you and obviously Father Deacon, you're always welcome. It's your it's your house uh, for about um, another topic re related to Islam. I can't remember the details now, uh, so we, maybe we could do that. We'll see. Definitely, um, without yeah. a doubt. Yeah, thank you. Definitely, Father Deacon. Perhaps any closing kind of thoughts and any plug you want to put in as well. Yeah, this has been a great conversation. I, I really appreciate it. Hearing both of your perspectives has been very helpful to me. You know, Islam is something that's always fascinated me because uh, one of my great interests is, of course, Eastern Christianity. And it's pretty much impossible to study the history of Eastern Christianity without learning about Islam. They're, they're very much interwoven, very, very much so. So I really appreciated thinking about this at a different level. Um, as far as plugs go, check out my website. It's easttowest.org, E-A-S-T, the number two, west.org. Uh, I have a book in progress. Hopefully I'll finish a draft of it this summer. It may take a while to get it edited, but it's about 80% done right now. And then um, also, if you go on YouTube and look up Becoming Byzantine, uh, we have new episodes in the works for that. Hopefully within the next few months, you'll start seeing them appear. That's with myself, Father Daniel Dozier, and Robert Klesko from EWTN, and Father also Michael Wynn, Father Michael Wynn from Canada. Um, so, you know, Subscribe, stay tuned. More's coming there as well. Thanks. Awesome. Father Deacon, would you bless us with a closing prayer, perhaps? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I will use my favorite closing prayer for these type of things. The prayer to the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly King, Advocate, Spirit of Truth, whoever we are present and fill all things, treasure of blessings, bestower of life, come and dwell within us. Cleanse us of all that defiles us, and our good one, save our souls. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. At one point, we had over 200 tuning in. Everybody hit like, share, subscribe. I hope you were edified. Everybody, God bless you. Subdeacon, God bless you. Father Deacon, God bless you. Look forward to being back with you all and dialoguing with you all again. You all take care. Thanks, guys.